Well, it is good to be back with you guys. Uh, as, uh, as Lynn mentioned, I got to spend a couple of weeks in Texas where I was teaching at Houston Baptist University where I uh, get a chance every now and again to go there and, and lecture. And so I was there for two weeks uh, with a lot of people who are engaged and excited about being in ministry and in, in leadership uh, over, over their adult life. And so it was, it was fun and it was, uh, it was a really interesting context for me to be there and to teach for a couple of weeks about, about leadership in this elective class during a, a quick Jan term uh, seminar that they have. And then along the way, to be thinking about this particular message. And so if you got your Bibles, I hope you do, turn with me to the, the book of Colossians chapter 4. Uh, that, that Today I want us to address the idea about personal evangelism. What do we do about personally sharing our faith. And, and so as we began this month in this series of messages about how do you live the life, getting into a new year, how do you live out your faith, we've talked about Bible study and, and about prayer. And, and, and so you've gotten to hear from me and, and last week from my, uh, our good friend Chris Dolberry, which I was excited that he got to spend a couple of weeks with the fellowship as well, one week at, at the Two River Campus and then one week here with you guys at the Mount Juliet Campus. And, and as we're, we, we go on this kind of story arc about what do you do about living the life as a Christian, there is always this element where we, we have to make sure that we, we get to that point where we know that verbalizing our faith, being able to talk about it, not just in, in a mildly coherent fashion, but in a way that is passionate, that we really mean it, that, that we know that God has done something extraordinary in our lives that has changed the direction of our eternity, and so we want to make sure that we can, we can put that into everyday language. That's a part about of who we are. And so here in Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, is Paul, the, the early leader of the church, is writing to this, uh, this early congregation, first century congregation. He says this in verse 2, Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. Now, I I am convinced, I, I, I bet everybody in this room is as well, uh, that for us, sharing your faith uh, should be a normal part of the Christian life. And yet, a lot of times, it feels incredibly weird. It, it feels strange, and, and because you don't want to be the oddball in the conversation, you don't want to be the person who stands out, because our culture ha has uh, held up kind of as this banner that everybody's opinion is equal and everybody's religious views are of equal weight. And, and so we don't want to suddenly look like we're the bigot in the room and that we're the one that, that is just pointing fingers at people and just jabbing our fingers in people's faces. We're just waving around our Bibles. And, and, and that's not what we, we see as God's call to us as believers in the New Testament, and certainly it is not reflective of what Paul says here, but there have been times when I've been sharing my faith where I did feel like, man, am I doing this right? You know, am I saying the right thing? Am I answering the right questions? Is I, am, I, am I talking in such a way that, that people understand that I, I'm not just mad about something, that I'm actually excited about this thing? Because if you've been up and down, say, Broadway in downtown Nashville during, you know, weekends when there's a lot of events, every once in a while you'll see street preachers and sometimes they're gracious and other times they just have megaphones and they're screaming at people like they're really, really angry. And, and, and so we get this picture in our mind of who we do and who we don't want to be. And so the normal Christian life, I am convinced, is one in which we share our faith on a regular basis. And, and, it, and it helps me to recognize that as I read through the Scripture from beginning to end, that my responsibility and your responsibility is that we're supposed to share our faith. That's where we're responsible. And then it is God's ultimate responsibility that then He is the one who brings the harvest out of that. It's not my responsibility and your responsibility to make somebody believe. You don't just argue somebody into the faith but rather you present to them the arguments for the faith and then leave the responsibility up to God. But God wants you to speak to other people about what he has been doing in your life. And, and as much 
as we might engage in this work and as much as we can be passionate about this work, about the people that are around us, there is this item that we can never let fall out of our memory. And that is as much as you would like for your neighbors and your family members and your coworkers and the members of this community and the global population, as much as you and I want them to become Christians, God is much more passionate than any of us could ever imagine. I mean, ultimately, he is more passionate about the souls of men and women than we are, even the people that are closest to you. And so that's why we engage in this work, because he was passionate about you, and so now we have the opportunity to share in the passion of God for other people. And so as I look at this passage, let me give to you uh, several different ideas that I, that I want you to hold on to and, and, and kind of mull over and take this, this passage with you maybe throughout the rest of this afternoon and into the evening. Maybe use it as a, as a time of devotion uh, of just your own personal, you know, kind of working over in this thing about, all right, so how am I doing in this? The first thing I, I see in this passage uh, is that we need to begin with prayer. Uh, verses 2 and 3, let me read those again, because it's this idea that, that Paul doesn't just launch into you know, a, a guilt trip on everybody, that you haven't been talking enough about Jesus and you ought to be ashamed of yourself, and, and, you, don't, and you just need to make sure that you've got all your philosophical arguments all lined up. But he begins with prayer, and he says, devote yourselves to prayer, stay alert in it with thanksgiving at the same time. Pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I am in prison. Some of you maybe have heard of the idea, of there, there's a book out that's been out for uh, quite a long period of time, about 20 years, written by Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. There's probably some of you married couples that, that you've read that book, and, and in that particular book, Gary Chapman, who's a, 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 he's a trained pastor, but he's also got degrees in clinical psychology, he talks about how we, we give and receive love in different kind of ways. There are some people that give love and they receive love through, uh, through uh, quality time. There are other people who give and receive love through words of encouragement. So he's got this whole kind of grid and matrix that you, you can kind of test your relationships through. It's a good illustration because there are people in your life that they're going to receive the Word of God, they're going to receive the gospel in different ways, and we need to be prayerful and discerning about that, that not everybody in your workplace or in your neighborhood or in your family or your circle of friends, that they're all going to receive the gospel in an identical kind of fashion. And so we need to be people that begin with prayer because we need the insight of God and we need the discernment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So, that, so we want to start with prayer so that we can be ready for every unique moment that's going to happen in our lives. So that at the time and the opportunity when it arises, that one, that we'll recognize it, and that two, we'll be ready. And so we begin this prayer, this idea with being devoted to prayer. It is an interesting kind of turn of phrase here that Paul uses because we think about personal devotional time, that that's that time I set a time, uh, you know, aside in my day or in my week when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to specifically sit down and I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pray. But, you know, this is where we get the idea of personal devotional time, that, the, that you are devoted to it, that there is a commitment there, that, that it's not something that is just kind of a passing fancy. And, it, and this kind of prayer does require devotion, on our part, that I am going to, I'm bought in, that I'm all in with this kind of prayer time, not just that I'm going to put it on my calendar and so chronologically I'm devoted to it, but I am passionately devoted to this kind of prayer, that I want to pray for open doors. I want to pray like Paul asked for prayer, that, that we be given the opportunity to speak the word of life to people. When I, when you look at the life of Paul, there is, in one of his other letters, in the book that he wrote, the letter that he writes to the Romans, in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, Paul says to the Romans, he, he, used, he exaggerates this point. Our English uh, teachers in high school always told us that this is called hyperboles, when you, you over-exaggerate a point in order to make a point. And in Romans 9, 3, Paul says, I wish that I could be cut off and accursed from Christ if I, I would be willing to be cut off and accursed from Christ if my fellow Israelites, my fellow Hebrew people could know him. 
So Paul makes this grandiose kind of statement of, I would be willing to face the fires of hell and judgment if everybody else of my kinsmen, everybody else of of my ethnicity, of my countrymen, if all the rest of them could hear the gospel, I would be willing to be cut off from Christ. I mean, that's how deeply passionate Paul is about the gospel. When Jesus uh, on the, on the, at the Passion Week, at the beginning of the last week of his life, when he knows he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to go in and he's going to be arrested and he's going to be crucified, it says as he approaches Jerusalem, he pauses and he weeps. It says that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and he says, if only you understood the peace that was coming to you today. And so we need to have this kind of, of passionate prayer life for people knowing that there are, there, are, there are hundreds and thousands of people around us every day that don't know the gospel of Christ, that are completely unaware, that have never really heard it. And he said, but, and so we pray for these kind of open doors with this weeping spirit of Christ so that we can be alert and that we can listen, but also that we pray with thanksgiving, that we're grateful for what he has done for us, we're grateful for what he has done through us, that we pray with grateful hearts that it is likely that the people that you would love to share the gospel with, that it's not like you're just going to show up and you're going to start at ground zero, but that God has likely already been plowing up the soil of their heart, preparing them in order to hear the seed of the gospel, that he is getting them ready. And and so you don't have to worry about, well, you know, I'm there's nothing else that has been done. You know, there's nobody else that has prepared anything that you pray with gratefulness, knowing that God is, is not cruel, that, that, that he doesn't just operate like the, the old fake gods of Greek mythology where they're just pretentious and childish and, 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 and they are, are uncaring, but that you pray with gratefulness that I am devoted to prayer, I am thankful in prayer because of what God has done in me and what he's doing in other people. And that, that we pray, as Paul directs them to pray for him, pray at the same time for us to, that God may open a door to us for the message. You know, Paul is, he then goes on to say, you know, this is the message for which I am in prison. Now, Paul could have asked them, pray that, that God will just miraculously open the doors. I mean, this has happened before. We see it in the book of Acts where Paul and Silas, his partner, are in prison and are in chains and God miraculously opens up the prison doors. And so Paul could have just said, hey, just pray that we get out of prison. I mean, most of us, that would likely be you know, the prayer of our hearts. Uh, most likely Paul is, in, is being held prison in a house prison at this point. And so he could have just prayed for his own personal safety, but instead he says, pray that God will open up the doors for the message. And and so you and I need to pray consistently and constantly for this specific issue, that God will open up opportunities for you and I to share the gospel message with people. And, And so you can do that in a multitude of ways, whether that's sharing what you've heard on Sunday, whether that's sharing what happened in a life group, sharing about conversations that you've been having with other believers about what God is doing in your life, or it's sharing what God has done in your own personal devotional time. But imagine the transformation that could take place in your neighborhood, in your city, in your circle of friends, if you took the time to pray diligently and you prayed passionately for God to open up the doors. So if God does open the doors, and I believe he's going to, then what do you do next? Well, number two is I would encourage you then to act graciously. Uh, We need to live in a way that that sets us aside. And and so look at verses four and five. So Paul says, hey, devote yourself to prayer and pray that we will have an opportunity to speak the message of the gospel, that, that Jesus has come, he has died in our place, on the cross, for our sins, and that if you, by faith, will, will repent of your sins and accept him as your Lord and Savior, you too will inherit eternal life. This message of the Messiah. And then he says, so pray for us that we're going to have this opportunity to speak the mystery. And then he says in verse 4, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. And then he says, act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. You know, we need to live in such a way that our behavior never contradicts the gospel. 
Live in such a way that people will look at your life and say, that's exactly what, when the gospel is alive in somebody, that's what it looks like. And so we need to act graciously that our, that our, that our words are seasoned with salt, that, it, that we preserve what is going on in our lives of the power of the gospel so that you and I can be an example of the power of gospel transformation. Because he says, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Uh, The idea that we would act graciously, that you would act graciously, grace, full of grace in your life, because you and I as Christians are required to speak what the message of the mystery of the Messiah is to a world that doesn't know it yet. And so would you lean into that work and live in such a way that people would see that you have acted wisely toward outsiders, redeeming the time that you've got. And some of the ways that you do that is that is that when it comes to personal evangelism and personal witnessing, that it's not about winning an argument, it's about persuading a doubter. I mean, we get into so many uh, debates with people, and all we want to do is just win the argument. We're not concerned with, you know, we kind of lose the person, and, and it's just about the proposition. You know, we, we lose sight of the human being that's in front of us because we just want to win the argument. And it's something that so many of us have to deal with. I mean, we all like winning. We all like coming out on top. We all like being the smartest person in the conversation and in the room. And we don't want to lose, especially when it comes to an issue like this, like the gospel, Jesus, the Bible, the big stuff. And so we let our, our emotions and our hearts get away from us. And so graciousness means that I have decided I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm not going to be a jerk when I evangelize other people. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be mad at people. I'm not going to be upset if they have a point that I don't know how to answer at the moment or if they say something ugly about the church or if they say, yeah, you know, but what about this other thing? I'm not going to be a jerk, but that you're going to live in such a way that your, li- your life wi- lines up with the gospel so that you speak well of others, even with others with whom you disagree. You don't misrepresent their positions. Instead, it is our role to act graciously so that we can better understand the story of a doubter. Over the last couple of weeks while I was in Houston teaching this course on Christian leadership, one of the, the great disciplines of leadership uh, all across the board, but I think especially true within the life of our faith is, is, is the discipline of self-awareness. You know, do you really understand your own story? Why do you behave the way you do? What's your backstory? You know, what's going on underneath the surface? Do you clearly understand where you are on the journey of maturity toward Christ and, and what it is that makes you tick, what it is that ticks you off? And you got to recognize that everybody that you're going to share your faith with, in order to act graciously with them, you need to understand what's going on under the surface. It's not just that they had a big philosophical question. Most of us, most of us normal, walking around, going to work every day kind of people, do not sit around and dream up philosophy. We don't sit around and read philosophical arguments. I mean, that's not what most people do. And so likely when you, when you are trying to share your faith with someone who doubts or who's got questions or maybe somebody who's even angry about it and you're working really hard to be gracious toward them and, and they're getting fitful and upset and frustrated with you, then part of what it is is not just trying to win the argument but try to understand the doubter. Understand what, what, what is it that has brought them to this place in their life? Why is it that they now you know, refuse to even believe in the presence of God? Why is it that they have decided that if God is out there, that he's really not involved in our life? Why is it that God, they, that they picture God as somebody who's, who's just angry and judgmental all the time? Was there some death in their family that was particularly hurtful for them? Have they experienced some kind of failure in life where they think, well, God just doesn't care about me? Is it that they morally feel like God could never accept me or forgive me? And so they just think that God's love and forgiveness is really not big enough to cover up their own lives. And so instead of using people for evangelistic target practice, 
I want to encourage you to include them into your life and invest in them as a human being. That if you're going to act graciously, I I want you to drop any kind of idea of just drive-by evangelism. Of it's just going to be rapid fire, just bam, 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 bam. Well, I dropped a track of the four spiritual laws on their desk and I'm done. Or I gave them a New Testament, so I'm done. And this idea of just this, you know, that I just use them for target practice. I I want to encourage you to never hide behind Facebook, Twitter, and a string of emails of just arguing with somebody else but instead get with them face to face and include them into your life so that you can minister to them it's why life groups are so critical in in our congregation because it it builds up and encourages the believer but it gives space and opportunity for somebody who is still doubting somebody who's not sure about everything, somebody who's got questions that they can sit down in the living room of some trusted friends as you're plowing through the Bible, and and they can say, but I got a question here. Uh, But I don't understand this over here. But uh, let me tell you part of my story. And so we begin with prayer, and we say, God, we need you to just fling open the doors of all sorts of opportunities. And I'm going to devote myself to looking for those opportunities and praying for the discernment from the Holy Spirit for those opportunities. And then throughout my entire life, I'm going to live in a gracious kind of way where I'm going to include people into deep friendships and into deep fellowship. And I'm not just going to use them for target practice, and I'm not going to get angry and frustrated. But then I think he says here in verse 6, that the third thing is that, but we do need to speak clearly. It says in verse 6, your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. There is this requirement that he he says earlier in verse 4, that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. There is this terrible old saying that has, that has made the rounds, and, and unfortunately it was, a, it, was a, it was a lot of ministers who gave it traction on Facebook and Twitter and social media over the, over the last few years. It, it's, it's been included in illustration books and quote books that pastors have used for a long time, and it is attributed back uh, to one, uh, a fourth century uh, leader of the church, St. Augustine. And supposedly, Augustine said, preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. And that just sounds, I mean, that just sounds like something a Baptist preacher would say, doesn't it? I mean, that just sounds right. The problem is, Augustine never said it, um, and, 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 and there's a part to it that is actually, at the end of the day, it's a little unhelpful. Now, should you live in such a way that it reflects the gospel? Absolutely. I just spent a, you know, a few minutes talking about that. But here's the deal. It is always necessary to use your words. It is always necessary to speak clearly. It is always necessary to make the gospel just bluntly, blatantly, evidently, obviously understandable to people around us. And so I do want you to make it a priority in your life that you pray for God to give you an opportunity to share your faith, that you live in such a way that when you do share your faith, it makes sense, that nobody says, well, what he or she is talking about right now really doesn't match up with anything in their life. But more than maybe anything, I want you to make sure that you are speaking clearly the message of the gospel, that you're using your words. I I challenged, last week I got a, a chance to be at a church down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, where I was preaching, and, and one of the things that I said to them, and, and it's something that I've had to really do some, some reflection in my own life about as I have, have been uh, leading you through this series of messages, and is I, I said to that congregation, and I've said this to our congregation as well at times, and I'm going to say it again now, is I want you to ask yourself the question. When was the last time in your life that you verbally presented the gospel to a person that you knew was lost. I mean, when was the last time? When was the last time that you can, you can you know, run back through the memory banks of your brain that you can remember, this is the last, I, I, can, te- I can tell you the, the person's name, I can tell you what their response was, and I can tell you that it was you know, two days ago, two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago, or I mean, and, and, how, and, and here's the thing. You may say, well, Philip, that's kind of an unfair question. I'm not really good at talking with people. But I don't want to be devastating, and, and this is not a, hey, man, you ought to feel bad and guilty, and you ought to cry right there in your chair. But as people who have inherited 
eternal life because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Somebody, whether it was a pastor on a platform or a Sunday school teacher in a small group room or it was a parent or a friend, somebody told you and me the message of Jesus. Somebody explained it to us. Somebody told us that that Jesus died for your sins. Somebody told us you're a sinner and you're separated from Christ because of your rebellion. Somebody told me Philip, there is, there is judgment that comes to us at the end of this life. Somebody told me, but Jesus died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice, and he was willing to stand in the place of, be, of having the wrath of God against sin being poured out on him rather than it being poured out on you. And if you'll put your faith in Jesus, if you'll trust him and only him for your salvation, he promises And God always keeps his promises. He promises that he'll save you. He promises that he'll adopt you into his family. He promises that he will forgive you of all of your sins, cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness, and and you will live forever with him in his presence, in in his heavenly dwelling. Somebody told me that. Otherwise, I would not have become a Christian. Otherwise, I would have just liked hanging out with holy people. I would have just hung out with moral people. I would have just hung out at, around a church building at worship services, and it would all been cool and fine. But you've got to make the gospel something that you verbalize. And part of it is making it a part of normal conversations. A lot of times we think, well, it's only these special, you know, specialized kind of moments that it's unlike any other moment in all of life. And, and if you feel uncomfortable talking about the Bible, God, Jesus, the gospel, if, you, if it just kind of makes your palms get sweaty and it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up and it gets you all nervous and, and anxious about that I've got to go share my faith, let me tell you, here is one of the easiest things that you can do to make it easier in the rest of your life to do that. And that is become an active part of the conversation in your life group. Make it, make not just that you're going to show up to life group, not that you're just at Bible study, you know, four out of every six meetings, but that you're going to be there as often as you possibly humanly, calendar-wise can, and that you're not just going to be kind of sitting on the side as an outlier to the conversation, but that you're going to engage in the conversation so that talking about the things of faith becomes normal and natural in your life, so that, that you get accustomed to answering questions, that you get accustomed to saying, you know, but this is what else I've learned from the Bible, that this is normal and natural about speaking for the faith. That's another one of the great reasons of being involved in a life group. And and there's all sorts of other things that you can do. You should strive in your own personal life to learn multiple ways to share the gospel, whether that's just using John 3.16, one of the most famous and favorite verses that has persisted in the church for centuries. That God loved the world in this way, that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Or there's lots of other ways to share your faith, whether it's a string of verses through the book of Romans or whether it's a five-point outline that you learn in an evangelism training class. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways, whether it's a track or an evangicube or whatever the, the kind of the widget kind of thing is that you use. But we need to make it a normal part of our life that when we talk about sin, that people are not put off. Because we're not talking about it from some big philosophical, theological position, but that we can discuss it about its destructive nature in our own personal lives, that we talk about it from its destructive nature of how it separates people from God, not just that we say, well, those evil people over there doing that bad thing, that we're just talking about news headlines, but that we're talking about people's eternity. So, it is this moment where we have to decide that we want to tell the compelling story of God's initiative to rescue us. We're not trying to build ladders so that people can climb up to heaven. We're not trying to set up moral codes that somehow people can get approved by God. But we're, we're telling the story that God reached out through eternity to come and get you. And so we've got to deal with our own fears about speaking the message of the truth of the gospel. Uh, A church leader uh, that I know, his name is Mike, Mike Breen, he said this, it's a little bit of a lengthier quote. He says, we are not all called to be pastors, but we are all called to care. 
We're not all called to be teachers, but we're all called to hold out the truth. We are all responsible for learning how to listen for God's voice, something that comes more naturally for the prophets among us, but we're all called to share the good news with others. But this takes all those who are not called to be evangelists out of their comfort zones. And we're not all apostles, but we must all learn to walk out into what God calls us to do. You know, I, we all know that just by the, law, by the law of percentages. Most people are not called to be pastors and evangelists and vocationally in ministry. Most people, 99.9% of people are not called or I, I, there's nothing in their lives that's ever going to make them go to Bible college or seminary or pick up a systematic theology, you know, that's 1,500 pages long and read it and write reports on it. Most of us don't do that, but all of us are called to share our faith and to show it off with our lives. And so you may not feel like you're gifted to evangelize, but the fact is we're all called to do the work of the evangelist. That's something that every believer needs to feel, a compulsion in their lives, that we, we, we feel called to share the good news. And it may not be the most comfortable thing that you feel like you do right now, but it can become one of the most natural things and the most natural outworkings of what God is doing in your lives. And so as Daniel uh, M. Is, uh, is teaching this morning over at the Two River campus, one of the things that he shared with me that, that we wanted to share with you this morning is this idea of, about then, then how can we bless people in a spirit of evangelism? Maybe you feel like you are just a beginner and you don't know exactly what to do next, so what do you do next? And so let me share it from you, uh, share it to you, and, and, and wrap this, kind of this idea up with an acronym of the word BLESS, B-L-E-S-S. -S. If you're taking notes, you can jot these things down that'll be on the screen. Just use this as somewhat of a matrix and kind of a construct about how do you press the, the gospel forward in your life if you feel like you're starting from ground zero. Well, B, as I've said earlier, begin with prayer. You know, make it a matter of prayer that you want to find ways to share your faith. And then L, listen to people. Uh, don't think that you have immediately have every answer that they need because you don't even know what their questions are yet. They may have questions that you've never even heard of yet that you say, you know what, let's explore this together, but listen to them. Uh, e, eat with them. Man, spend extended, large periods of time with people in an environment where, where you and they can get disarmed, where you don't feel like you've always got an agenda going on. Just spend time over a meal where you're just sharing life together. S, serve them. Find ways where they have needs where you can serve. Whether it is they need encouragement, serve them. Whether there's some physical need in their life where you can go and help them to fix it serve them. But then also share the story. I mean, it, it, you don't get it all until you get to that last point. And, and that last point of sharing the story may come earlier in the process. It may happen quicker than you think it will. And you can, you can be excited and celebrate that. But ensure in your life, make sure that it is a part of who you are, that you are constantly looking for ways to be a part of other people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis and not just this drive-by, drop the gospel off and you're out. But instead that you've dug in, that you've invited them into your circle of friends, that you have invested in them in a person, uh, as a person, as a friend, as a human being, and then that you're going to invite them to Christ that you want to see them included in the body of Christ, that, that you don't want them just to, to hang on the outskirts and maybe they'll come in one day and maybe they'll hear the right sermon and maybe my life group leader will say the right thing. But that you, as their friend, that, that you have spent the time in relationship with them, that they can see the gospel at work in your life and that you can speak clearly what it is. You know, I am not so naive as to think that everybody in this room has mastered these things. I have not. You have not. We're still working on it. Nor am I so naive as to think that maybe there's somebody here today that, that you personally need to respond to the gospel. I mean, you got religion down. I mean, you've got that. You even have church membership. Man, you have figured that thing out that, that you kind of, you, you gave all the right pat answers a long time ago. 
and, and so everybody kind of considers you to be a part of the club and, and in the thing and, and you're in the Bible study and, and you're here and you help you know, put up and take down chairs and all of that kind of good stuff and, and you've got the service thing of the church down pat. But when you search through your heart and in the quiet moments you recognize, man, I, I, have, I am living a lie. Because I am religious, I am spiritual, and I like the people that I get to hang out with, but I really don't have a relationship with Jesus. I never feel the conviction over sin. I rarely kind of sense that God is guiding me in any direction. I, I really don't know for sure that I ever nailed down a confession of faith in Him. I, I don't know that I ever really said to Jesus, you know, I want to belong to you. And if that's where you find yourself today, I want to invite you to make a decision right now. I, I want to I drive home to you the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, stepped out of eternity and onto planet Earth. That He lived as a man in order to live a perfect life so that He could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Uh, so that when he shed his blood, when he went to the cross, when he physically died, it was a perfect sacrifice for your sins and for mine. And that he said, if you would put your faith in me like a child puts his faith in his parent, that you could be saved. That if you would say to God, I repent of my sins, I need your forgiveness, I want to turn away from my rebellion and from my idolatry of self, that I'm going to fix everything, and I'm going to put my faith in you that you, that you could save me, that you could take me out of judgment, and you could, you could inha- that I would be adopted into the family of God. That can be yours today. You don't have to be religious, you don't have to be spiritual, you don't have to be Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, or anything else. What you have to be is God's. What you have to be is decide that you want to come under the sovereign lordship, the saving lordship of Jesus Christ. Because without him, you are dying in your sins. Without him, you're facing judgment eternally. Without him, you're going to be separated from him. Without him, there is no hope whatsoever. But with Jesus, there is hope and there is forgiveness.